Welcome back. We are still glad you are following this conversation in regards to what is happening in Uganda. Of course, on social media, the hashtag, eh, the hashtag, the hashtag is Uganda Decide. Uh, decides, and I can also see Bobby Wine is trending as well. So many people are sharing their messages of hope and encouragement in regards to uh, Bobby Wine's candidacy as one of the candidates in regards to the presidential race. We are keeping tabs with what is happening on social media. Again, there are some internet connectivity issues, as some would put it, in Uganda. But we are here to give you as much information as we can via all communication platforms. Of course, we're going to be having interviews um, via phone to just get the real feel and the proper information in regards to what is happening in Uganda. And also just trying to see um, how far Uganda has come as a country since their independence back in 1962. 59 years later, most of the, uh, pop at least 40% of the population is under the age of 30. And looking at the statistics is that most of this or rather this particular part of the population have only known one president. The elder population do say that, you know, Museveni is a leader who saved them from a time where they, are, they were under the leadership of a dictator and such hard times. So they do consider him as a savior. So today, are we going to be seeing a different conversation altogether in regards to the leadership of Uganda or not? And of course, Uganda has been having a lot of political issues over the years and more so looking at presidency given that they are currently under the 1995 constitution which was promulgated on the 8th of October back in 1995 and under this constitution when it comes to the president's term it was set at 75 years. In 2004, it was reaffirmed, but in 2017, we did see, uh, rather back in 2004, we did see Museveni, you know, just come to pull out that age, uh, the age cap when it comes to the presidency of Uganda. Are we yet to see a different conversation? Guys, when it comes to the constitution of Uganda, um, we are seeing even critiques coming in to say that they are very skeptical in regards to whether... Bobby Wine actually stands a chance because as is Museveni calls the country his what? Banana, banana plantations. Banana plantation. Now I'm talking about banana plantations and want to take a step in, in, in history. Mm -hmm. Remember if you are of the Catholic faith and if you're a Christian, you'd remember the pilgrims of Uganda, the mm. martyrs of, mm. U, of, of Buganda. Now in 1967, the constitution abolished mm -hmm. uh, the kingdoms altogether. Yeah. And Buganda was divided into four districts. But as we continue having this conversation, we're also going to be sharing the history of Uganda, what that was previously Buganda. Now we cross over to you, Sam, yep. and talk about matters of the constitution as it is right now. Actually, that is something that we would like to start discussing right now because pundits have argued that if Uganda is to get a credible poll at the end of the day, then amendments need to be done not only to the constitution but enabling legislation through parliament that is going to enable Uganda attain what exactly it desires. And right now, I'm joined by Honorable Dr. Miriam Matembe from Uganda. She'll be telling us, she wears quite a number of crowns, and she'll be letting us know what those are, especially when it comes to constitutional law. Dr. Tari, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to Good Morning Kenya. Yes, good morning to you. How is Kenya right now? Kenya, we are eager and anxious to find out what will be happening in Uganda. <laughs> uh, we are as anxious as we were, but for us, we hope and trust in our God. You know, our motto is for God and my country. is the only one who can redeem us and protect us from what is going on in this land. I tell you, and why the thought, why the notion that only an amendment in law that is going to cure what you term as a constitutional crisis in Uganda. But is it really an amendment in the constitution or it is in the type of leadership that is? Talk to because us about if it. You, if you can remember in mm -hmm. Uganda, it, it took us five and a half years to make a new 
constitution that was greatly participatory. It was being made against an experience that was so painful. Dictatorship killers and so on. And Ugandans got together and gave themselves the constitution. A new constitution will hope that uh, Uganda will now be reduced afresh and start afresh and move on. Uh -huh. And we put some safety nets in that constitution. We put the term limit that a president should not lead beyond 10 years of five term limit because we had seen that the problem of president who wants to stay in power long without changing we are causing us problems and when we went to ca we increased we even added another safety net we said no where let us also uh, limit the age because by the time we are 75 we have served this nation the way we want and we would need other people new people to come in with new ideas in accordance with the new environment and we put all this and we started moving on the right road and our constitution was acclaimed widely as one of the best constitutions based on people's views based on a bad experience which people wanted to avoid no, but no, what so happened down the road uh -huh. self -centered, self centered leadership led to removing of all these safety nets we have ended up with retrogression in terms of democratic governance. Yes. Now, if you return the, the term limit and uh, change the constitution without yes. changing the attitude and mentality of the leaders who are self-centered and power hungry, would you have made any difference? Good question that you pose there. Could there be any difference and thus the, uh, the concern is the legal framework currently as it exists in Uganda sufficient enough to promote change or what uh, Ugandans uh, decide or desire? As you know very well, uh -huh. Ugandans desired that constitution which was re changed. What they desired was a constitution that, you know, limited the powers of the president, limited the term and so on. The moment it was changed and it was, you know, I call it murdered. And now the president uses even the legislative, the legislative law that is there, even the institutions that are there. It is now more of just one person, dictator. Even laws which exist, are they being followed? For instance, when you look at this, the law that prevents people from organizing, from politicking, you know, from, you know, you know what is happening in Uganda, mm -hmm. we are in retrogression. The laws, even the few laws that are there, even the constitution, that, the provisions that are there, are not being followed. Uganda does not understand something called constitutionalism. We need to know that there is a constitution and then constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is a journey which you take when you lead in accordance with the constitution that you have made to your city. The Sorry, I want to say that Africans should not deceive themselves. It is about the attitude of the African leaders, the leaders who are self-centered and they are power hungry. Fair they point. Are not the, service oriented fair, fair point no, that you can, make right there can, but, you know, in that but perspective. I, I would like you to kindly clarify to our viewers in Kenya this morning what you call a misunderstanding what you term as a total disregard of the law how does it happen in the wake and in full glare of parliament and the judiciary in Uganda where are the checks and balances <laughs> In Uganda, the principle of separation of powers does not apply. Okay. In terms of the law on the record, in the papers, yes, there is separation of powers. But when it comes to practice, it does not work. The president takes authority over all these institutions. And what has caused this, by the way, is patronage, is, is, fina is it financialization of election. It, it is not the right leaders that we get into parliament. Uh -huh. Election is not about choosing the right leaders. It is about who has more money. People are driven 
by money. They are looking at election or parliamentary work as a job, not as a service, and they fear to lose the, like the judiciary. The militarism, the fear that has been caused by, you know, militarization. You know, in Uganda, I, I'm telling you that we are on the road back to, you remember me, you remember everything, the disappearance of the people, killing of the people. Why should, you know, elections be like a war? If you descend now on Kampara town now and you see the, all the armies on the road or whatever, and the declaration of the leaders, we shall crush you, we shall finish you. The, the, the laws and the constitution on the paper are not followed. All right. And talking about things not being followed, frameworks not being adhered to, where exactly did Uganda get it wrong in as far as crafting the law is concerned? Let me tell you, mm. the laws, you can go to read the laws and know in the constitution, the judiciary. The judiciary is supposed to be independent. You see, the parliament is supposed to be independent. The, two are, the, the three are supposed to be working in relation with one another. But now, the parliament surrendered its powers to the executive. The judiciary, they fear. They cannot stand up and decide what is right. They fear for their jobs, they fear for their lives. They f- but don't you know what is happening in Africa? Is it Uganda alone? You know what happened to your next neighbor in Tanzania? I was observing elections by virtual, virtual observation. You know what happened in Tanzania? And afterwards, after this election, the mud and so on, things appear to be as normal. Mm-hmm. And talking Quite about things... Sad. In Kenya, you better. We are so we admire Kenya. We are admiring you, by the way, right now. That handshake. Why should why should a person think that he's the only one who can lead a nation and anybody else who tries to compete? No, no. Well, on a lighter note or in a heavier note, but do we say this is Kenya? But uh, <laughs> moving on to what exactly needs to change. What amendments need to be embraced? What breath of fresh air does Uganda need right now for them to be able to achieve what they exactly desire in as far as leadership is concerned? I am not, I will repeat again to you. Mm-hmm. I am not looking at the change of the law. Mm. Because even if you change the law, that doesn't mean that the army will not come in and do what it wants. What Africa needs to change is mentality, attitudinal change of the people of Uganda, attitudinal change of the leadership, where you have people who look at leadership as a service, not as a way of making money, mm-hmm. not as a way of enriching your, your relatives and that kind of thing. It is attitudinal change. We need a new mind state, not only in Uganda, but in Africa in general. Because right now we are in elections, but elections have been about how, who can give much more money. It is not about capacity, it is not about quality leadership, it is not about ability, it is about who has much money. And then those sharks who have been corrupt, who have been stealing money, they go out there, they pay people money, and they come into parliament. Mm -hmm. And their role is not to serve people or to change and make good things, but to also enrich their stomach. All right. Honorable Doctor, kindly stay on the line. We will be engaging you much more in the course of this conversation. But right now, I'd like to rope hey, in. How long? For yeah, how long? yeah, just, 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 just stay on the line. In a getting back to you, but uh, I'd like to bring in my co-host, that is Jane, who's right here with me in studio. You've heard what African countries are saying about this country. We admire Kenya for the spirit of the handshake. What you've got to do, say about that, Jane? You know. When we hear it from other people, other people, That's somebody in a different country, it reminds us of the little things that, to some extent, we may take for granted because we have had different experiences altogether. Here in the country, we are also um, 
not having an as easy a time. You know, there's so much political conversation going, but there they are. Um, Dr. Terry is saying that they are admiring our country for the simple act that we considered as the handshake, but to them, that is such a significant thing for a nation to be able to see from leaders who are who were thought to be, uh, you know, different sex, different opinion, different opinions altogether. And I just want to also to want to also bring in Ray and Doreen in regards to this. Ray only smiled Kidogo when she mentioned, you know, they admire Kenya for just the handshake that happened on the steps of Nyayo House. <laughs> I mean, what is not what is not to smile about that? I mean, um, from outside looking in, Kenya has made quite some strides, and even uh, I can take you back to the announcement of uh, you know the presidential elections by now retired. CJ, that is David Maraga. We, I mean, we, we got to the annals of history. So yes, Kenya looks very, you know, forward thinking in as far as matters of, uh, you know, legislation as well as, you know, matters of election. And I like what our, our guest on call has mentioned and has posed quite the question there. Why should elections be like war? Remember, we're still having this conversation even here in Kenya where we're talking about a rotational presidency so that we do away with the winner takes it all. But now I want to take it back to you, Sam, there, and the question, why should elections be like war? That's what Ugandans are feeling right now. Sam. All right, and getting back to Honorable Doctor, who's still with us, Mariam, who's still with us on phone, Asante Sahana for uh, uh, agreeing to be on hold with us right here on the show but tell us what are the key issues that you're observing from your point of view in as far as this election is concerned you know from my point of view as you know uganda in uganda there is fear about leaving power mm -hmm. and so any if there is any credible or seemingly credible member of opposition comes on board to contest elections, then that calls for violence, for fire, for intimidation, for all sorts of things. Now the issue at hand is that when this young man Bob Wine came up, it was like when Rich came up. I have seen Uganda during like this 86, 96, and a little bit up to 2001. We were doing well, we were moving forward. As long as the leader doesn't have anything in a credible person to threaten his power. But the moment which they came on board, that was a big threat, violence started from there. Militarization monetization of politics and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And now in this season, we have this young man who we know, Bobby Wine. And Bobby Wine coming, like all the young people, and you know the people of the Bobby Wine era were born, some of them were born when the Form 7 came to power. And so they have seen their third unemployment, you know, all these kind of factors. And they want change. So when they came up with this mind of wanting change, mm -hmm. instead of now going to policy to, to elections, we are really like at war. It is like we are in a war. Intimidation, people are, are, are being killed, people are disappearing, people, you know, they are so scared, all because of wanting to stay in power. And then the other people are also saying, we are also coming, come by and by. So that is now what is at stake in this country. All right. Honorable Dr. Motembe, we wish you all the best today. I'm very sure it will be a busy day, and we shall keep linking up with you in the course of coverage of Decision Time in Uganda right here on KBC Channel 1. In the meantime, good morning, and have a fruitful day. <laughs>